In this video, we're going to get into free cash flow valuation. In a previous video, I walked through a generic free cash flow valuation example just to introduce the idea of how to value a company using free cash flows to equity. In this one, I thought I would walk through an actual company to show you how we might apply it a little bit beyond just a textbook example. Now, you're probably going to want the template here to follow along. So if you just go to tinyearl.com, Brocker, FCFE1, it's just free cash flow to equity one, you can download this template and that way you'll have these handouts along with you to follow through. I'd encourage you to actually walk through these calculations with me or on your own as part of learning this process. So we're going to look at Apple and we're going to try to figure out what Apple is worth using the free cash flow to equity model. Now, one advantage for doing this with Apple is in the previous video I mentioned free cash flow to equities work well for companies that don't pay dividends. Right now, at least as I'm filming this in the summer of 2011, Apple is not paying dividends, so this work provides us a perfect example. First of all, my legal disclaimer here, so no one ends up suing me for getting them to invest in a company. This is an example meant to illustrate how one would apply a free cash flow valuation in practice. It is not investment advice. I did this really quick. I spent about 10-15 minutes on this valuation analysis. If I was really trying to value Apple, I would spend a lot more time trying to forecast what their product mix is going to be, what the margins are going to be. That's not what's going on here. So this is just a quick and dirty approach, not a realistic model that some equity analyst would hopefully be using. But let's go back to free cash flow to equity. And remember that starts with net income, adds back in depreciation because it's not a cash expense. We're not really paying anything. What we're paying for is our actual capital expenditures. So we've got to pull those out. Anytime we see an increase in our accounts receivable, our increase in our inventory, that's going to lower our cash flows. On the other hand, if we increase our accounts payable, that's going to increase our cash flows. So we have to adjust for networking capital. We also have to look at changes in debt. Any new debt issued is a positive cash flow for equity. Any debt paid off is a negative for cash flow to equity. So this is our basic formula for calculating free cash flow to equity. Now I'm going to look at Apple. This is their financial statements from their recent annual reports. So this covers through September 2010. Again, I'm filming this in the summer of 2011, so we don't have the 2011 statements in yet, but it has been a while since these have come out. So again, this is not a current example that you should be taking to go decide whether or not you want to buy Apple. Just an idea of how you might walk through the process if you're doing this on your own. And I'm going to hold these up real quick just so you can see some of these numbers, but keep in mind the templates online on that tiny Earl Google Docs has it, so you can go pull these up on your own. But you can see net income is the starting point. That's $14 billion. Depreciation, a little over $1 billion, and all these other values. That's going to give us our cash flow from operating activities in 2010 of $18,595,000,000. Next we have capital expenditures. Capital expenditures were about $2 billion. Now, Apple also noticed they have this investments category, which is big here, $11 billion. We're not going to include that because what that is for Apple is they have so much cash right now, they're making a lot of investments into short-term marketable securities. That's not a capital expenditure. That's not something we want to include. It's just basically a cash substitute that is hopefully going to earn a small amount of interest. So what we want to focus on is our cash flow from operating activities, which includes net income, our depreciation, our changes in working capital. Then we need our capital expenditures. And finally, we want to look at debt. Debt issued is a positive, remember. Debt repaid is a negative. But let's look across this net borrowings. And notice for the past three years, Apple has had no net borrowings, which means they haven't been issuing debt. 
They haven't been buying back debt. So we're going to ignore that in our analysis. We're going to assume Apple is not going to be issuing any debt or paying off any debt in the near future. Now we also need growth rates. Here's another example of where I said this is a quick and dirty approach. I just tried to come up with some quick estimates of Apple's growth rates kind of from where they are right now and projecting that they're going to run into increased competition, saturated markets over time, and so I had declining growth rates until I got out to year six where I assumed a 3% constant growth from now to infinity. So the idea here is Apple is a rapidly growing company at this point in time. They're becoming a rather large company. They're one of the largest companies in the equity markets and therefore I think they're going to have a hard time sustaining their high growth. So we've got growth declining over time. That's typical of large companies and that's our anticipation. Now if Apple can innovate and come up with new products, their growth rates might be a little higher down the road. And they've had a great track record of doing that, so it's really quite conceivable that their growth rates could be higher going forward. On the other hand, maybe they run into a situation where some competitor jumps past them and their growth rates slow down quicker than I anticipated. We don't know, but part of what you have to do as an analyst is forecast what those dividends or cash flows are going to grow at over time. Next, we need a discount rate. And I'm going to use the security market line, so I need beta. I went and looked up the beta for Apple, and it was around 1.2. Risk-free rate right now, I use the 10-year Treasury note for this, and that's right around 3%. And then a risk premium for stocks. I assume 6%. That can vary a little bit depending on what you think the outlook is, how risky the economy is, how sensitive investors are to risk. Right now, I decided to use a relatively high risk premium that's near the higher end of the range because the economy is not real strong at this point. And there's some concerns as I filmed this video about the debt situation in the U.S. and Europe. And that might make investors more sensitive to risk and a little bit higher risk rate. Also, the last thing we're going to need is the number of shares outstanding because the free cash flow to equity model gives us a firm value and we want to convert that to a share price. So we need to divide at the end by the number of shares outstanding. Step one, forecast our free cash flow to equity through year six, which is where we came to our constant growth rate. And we start that with our free cash flow year zero. Now, remember when I showed you that statement of cash flows for Apple? What I did is just start with total cash flows from operating activities, which is $18,595,000,000. The idea is this includes our net income. That was our starting point, net income. It includes the depreciation. And it includes any changes to non-cash working capital as well as any other adjustments that really reflect cash flows and move us from a net income to a cash flow basis. So that was my starting point. And then I took out the capital expenditures of two million. And I didn't worry about adjusting for debt, remember, because we said Apple doesn't have any debt that we have to worry about. So that gives me a free cash flow to equity of sixteen billion five hundred and ninety million. And I just dropped it down and got rid of a couple zeros. So it looks like $16,590 there. Factor in my growth rates, growing at 50%, growing at 20%, 15, 10, 8, down to my constant growth of 3% that I assumed. Again, these are just guesstimates. Your estimates may vary. The better you are at estimating what those growth rates are, the more successful you're going to be as an investor. Once we have the cash flows, then we need the required return. I just used the security market line. Our risk-free rate we said was 3%, beta 1.2. Our risk premium of 6% gives us a required return of 10.2%. So what we're saying is based on this model, investors should be wanting a 10.2% rate of return on Apple stock, and that's what they're going to use to discount the cash flows. Now we solve for the value of all the free cash flows during the constant growth stage. Remember earlier when we forecasted cash flows in years one through six? Cash flows don't stop in year six. 
Apple doesn't liquidate right here. Instead, Apple is a continuing company. We're assuming it keeps growing at 3% a year. So after here and beyond, the company is growing at a constant rate. We can use the constant growth model, which just takes the free cash flow in year six. This is free cash flow to equity in year six. Just plug that in, divide by the required return minus the constant growth rate. That says the value of Apple cash flows to equity are going to be $583 billion, $625 billion as of year five. So now we have cash flows. Discount those back. You can use your cash flow worksheet in your financial cash or financial calculator. CF00, we always assume that we're missing the current cash flow. Our year one cash flow we forecasted earlier, remember, at 24,855. So we're just plugging that in as year one. Year two was 29,862. And so on, down to we get to year five. And in year five, we have two cash flows the free cash flow to equity, 4797, as well as the value of all the cash flows in years six and beyond, which was 583,625. So we're adding those together to get our cash flow in year five. Note that this cash flow in year six does not go into our cash flow worksheet because that's already part of this 583,625 million. Discount rate is 10.2 percent. Solve for net present value. That gives us the value of the free cash flows as of today, 482 billion. All that's left is convert that to a per share price. Take the 482 billion, divide by the 925 million shares outstanding, gives us a share price of $522. Based on this calculation, that's saying Apple would be worth $522 per share if you bought the entire company and owned the entire company. Now, when I prepared this, the current price of Apple was 360. Just a day or two before I filmed this, I actually prepared these slides about a week ago and just got around to filming it. Apple had their earnings announcement, which was better than expected, and the price is up around 390 now, but at the time we filmed this, the current price was 360. Based on that, Apple is undervalued and should be purchased. It's undervalued because reset it's worth 522 based on our analysis. We can buy it for 360. This is a bargain. We're buying the stock for about $160 less than what it's currently worth. However, be careful. A couple of things to consider whenever you do this type of analysis and you come up with something very different like we have here. Are your estimates valid? Remember I said that I did this relatively quickly. I didn't spend time looking at Apple's product mix. Maybe their iPhone 4, they're going to have more competition. Maybe the margins are going to come down a little bit on that. Maybe they're not going to sell as many iPad 2s. Maybe they're going to have to lower prices and have smaller margins. I don't know. I just took some quick estimates. So. One thing I would probably want to do if I saw this huge discrepancy before I went out and bought the stock, I'd say let's go back to the drawing board and try to look at this in more detail. Try to make more accurate cash flow projections for the next few years. The more accurate my cash flow projections are, the more reliable my estimates are going to be. Whenever you come up with a stock price that shows it's significantly overvalued or undervalued, before you go out and short the stock or buy the stock, First of all, go back and double check everything. Make sure you're confident in your forecast because that's critical. You might have heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. Same applies for this model. If we don't have reliable forecasts for our free cash flows to equity, the results are meaningless. Another thing that we might have to be careful about is might the free cash flow to equity approach overvalue the firm? The answer is yes because remember what we're assuming here is if we buy the entire company, all those cash flows belong to us. However, unless you plan on going out and buying every single share of stock outstanding, 
which remember at the value you think it's worth is going to require you to come up with four hundred eighty two billion dollars based on the current price maybe you can do that for a little less maybe you're only going to need to come up with three hundred fifty billion dollars but what typically happens when you see a takeover does it currently get executed or does it get executed at the current market price or does the buyer have to pay a premium usually the buyer ends up paying a premium maybe twenty percent thirty percent sometimes as much as fifty percent to buy the entire company it's probably going to be true with apple as well if you tried to do a takeover you're probably going to have to pay up and pay a pretty healthy premium to buy that company so the free cash flow to equity approach assumes you own every share you don't if apple is a good steward of your cash flows and eventually turns those into dividends which you're going to receive that's not going to matter much but because you don't own the company you can't control when you're going to get those cash flows free cash flow to equity might overvalue the firm a little bit that's a little bit of concern last comment I want to make here is spreadsheets are incredibly helpful for this type of analysis if you set up a good spreadsheet you can tweak it easily and make some changes for example in my initial assumptions let me go ahead and find that I started out with some growth rates 50 percent 20 percent 15 constant growth rate of three percent what if I want to tweak that a little bit and change those growth rates if it's a spreadsheet I can just quickly make some changes it's going to spit out a new answer for me or I can change the risk premium and see how that impacts things also I could more easily set up my spreadsheet to model the free cash flows I could make instead of forecasts for changes in free cash flows I could make some forecasts on how I think net income is going to grow over time and work through and re-estimate cash flows from there or I can make forecasts on sales try to figure out what their fixed and variable costs are going to be how that's going to play a part by going into spreadsheets I can set up a more accurate model to estimate free cash flows and I can easily tweak that model make some changes and see how that affects things so in valuation I think it's very important to get comfortable with using spreadsheets set up a good spreadsheet and that's going to make your valuation analysis a little bit easier again I don't think anybody's going to get rich be able to retire as a multi-billionaire be the next Warren Buffett off of watching this video if it was that easy I want to be filming videos I'd be on my own private island that I purchased but instead hopefully this is something that's going to give you a little bit of feel for how you can extend some of these theoretical models into a real world scenario with an actual company and start to dig a little deeper into valuation thanks and hope you enjoyed the video